for joining us today on Around the Peninsula. I'm Maria Soreo. Today you will meet the president of Marymount California University. I had a chance to sit down with Dr. Lucas LaMadrid, who reflects on his first year here at the college. First year as president here at Marymount California University, I want to go back just a little bit. Um, you literally moved from East Coast to West Coast. Mm -hmm. I, I know your wife was from California, but for you, what was the biggest adjustment? Uh, waking up and seeing it's a beautiful day. <laughs> so it's not a bad adjustment to have. But I will say, I will say that probably the biggest adjustment was the traffic, mm. getting used to the 405. And at first I figured um, that was sort of a penance that <laughs> you had to pay for living in such a beautiful spot. True. Uh, but now what scares me is I'm used to it. Right. But I have to behave because I have a personalized license plate. Ah, oh, so people know when you're driving. It says, yeah, MCU Prez. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm just sweet as pie on the four or five. <laughs> Is it difficult to kind of come in and be the new guy? Not or if you're president. <laughs> <laughs> or challenging. <laughs> you know? Well, it's a little, it's a little, uh, it's bad for the ego uh, because uh, every, you, you go from just being a voice in the room mm -hmm. to the most important voice in the room. Right. And so after a while, you have to remember it's not so much you as your position, and that really it's a position of service. And so, uh, but the, the task is so huge, uh -huh. and there are so many challenges in higher education today that really those challenges humble you. Uh -huh. And so you, you do the best that you can uh, in your 16-hour day, and then uh, go to sleep get in the morning, work out, and then go to work. How long does it kind of take you to meet all the staff and all the people that work here? It took a full two months, I would say. Mm -hmm. Now, it helped in that uh, I started April 1st of 2016. So in that sense, the, the faculty left for the summer <laughs> right. and gave me a little break to get to know them. And, and But then... The seniors left, and then I had to get used to the freshmen. Uh -huh. uh, but I, I would say about two to three months. When you first came here, mm -hmm. there were things you maybe wanted to change. Um, did that kind of evolve over time? It did. I think what developed is not so much what I wanted to change, but it took me about four or five months to really understand kind of the, the, the secret kernel mm -hmm. to to uh, the university and why it was a special place. At first, you're nice to the people, you make some managerial decisions, people get used to your personality, you get used to the culture, but it really takes a while, like any relationship, to understand uh, what's really special about it. And so I would say it, w it really took until December mm. for me to really understand uh, what was special about MCU and to be able to articulate that to prospective donors and to parents of prospective students. In theory, I think we think that you know you get your degree, you go to college, and mm -hmm. then you get a job. Why is it so tough these days for the getting the job part? Well, it's because employers are looking to cut costs, mm. like everyone. So they don't want to spend the money to train you six to eight months. They want you to be ready right away. So that's why one of the things that that we're doing uh -huh. is every student who graduates from here will have technology classes that they must take. Uh -huh. So they will know whatever their major is, how to code, how to read metadata, how to market on social media. Now, when I say market on social media, I don't mean Instagram, Facebook, and all that, and, and, and look at me at the beach. I mean, that's all fine. They probably know how to do that They anyway. know how to do that yeah. already. Yes. But how do you utilize social media for optimizing uh, a call to action. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what they're expected to do. That's what employers expect them to do, especially if they're my age. I don't know how to do that. So, but if I hire somebody, I want them to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that our students, whatever they major in, that they'll be able to they're do ready. it. They're mm ready. -hmm. This is a Catholic university. What does Catholic tradition mean to you? Because everybody is welcome here. Yes. 
Here's how I translate it. The heart of the Catholic tradition is this. Every student is sacred. No student is bypassed, ignored, or pushed to the margins. Whoever they are, wherever they come from, whatever their religious background. So this is a truly a diverse place. Not because we prize diversity in some politically correct uh, no, as a politically correct notion or standard, mm -hmm. but because it's really our heritage and it goes to the heart of what we believe, that really we all are images of God. And so imagine, no matter who you are or what your background, if you come here, if you send your child here, mm -hmm. wouldn't you want that child to be treated as sacred? Absolutely. Now, sacred is not spoiled. That's true. There's that's, a difference. That's another university. <laughs> that's true. In L.A. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's talk about real-world learning. Mm. Um, why you think that's important um, that students connect that way with school and the mm -hmm. real world? I think that's a, that's a really um, great question because that is what I meant about really trying to understand what's at the heart mm -hmm. of the university. Uh, today, especially in private education, but even in public education, the paradigm has changed. It's no longer that you work hard and then you interview and based on, on your, your grades and your interview skills, you get hired by a company and then you, you, they train you for six months. Mm -hmm. And then you work as hard as you can for that company for 35 years, going as high up in the ladder and then you retire, go to Florida, and die. <laughs> yes. Right? That's changed. Except going down to Florida to die, people still do people that. People still do that. They still do that. I shouldn't say that. My mom and dad live in Florida. <laughs> but um, now employers expect you to hit the ground running. Right. So what are the skills that students need in the here and now to be ready to hit the ground running? And also the way students learn is different. It used to be that students would go to lecture, they would get the theory, and they would apply it later. Mm -hmm. Today, they want to see the application right away. Mm. So they, want, they learn best by seeing the theory applied in action. So for us, we look at ways to really promote uh, service learning, uh, but also uh, internships, mm -hmm. and really solid examples within the classroom so that the real world in a sense, infiltrates right. the classroom experience. And then the classroom experience applies to the real world. This location is so very special. I remember the first time I saw Pepperdine University across yeah. the street from the Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. and thought, am I going to go to school if I go there? You know, mm -hmm. because it was so beautiful. You have that here. Mm -hmm. It's so incredibly beautiful. I, the ocean views, it clears the mind. Mm -hmm. I think it helps you to learn better. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Well, I'm, I, I still sort of pinch myself when I walk between the buildings and, and look at the view. Yeah. Uh, what is very interesting about the views is it sort of centers you. Mm -hmm. So college is stressful right. wherever you go. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's neat about our views is it, it helps to calm you and put things in perspective. Mm -hmm. When you look at the ocean, it's not only calming, but it's vast. It's huge. And so it really, suddenly my problems don't seem that big compared to the vastness of the ocean. But you know what's really cool too is we have veterans and we're making a concerted effort to, uh, uh, to recruit veterans. We have a, a new veteran center. Yes. And the mayor was here for its mm -hmm. opening. That's right. And, and it was wonderful. And I know that RPV is super supportive of our veterans. And so it's, it makes me proud to live in a city that is patriotic. But our veterans, especially those who've had combat experiences, find it peaceful. And to me, that's something I didn't expect. And it get, brings me a lot of joy to see that for our veteran students, this is the place that helps them, uh, appreciates them, appreciates their service, but also helps them to forget some of the, the trials that they had to endure in service for our country. What do you think are the biggest challenges facing students today? Uh, you know, there's so much information overload mm -hmm. for young people today. So how do you uh, ignore the distractions and focus on, on what you have to take care of for your schoolwork, 
for your personal life, for your spiritual life. Mm. It's, so it becomes difficult for them mm -hmm. because the information that they get today, when I was their age, I mean, the kid with the TV on the, on the floor of your dorm was the most popular kid. Exactly. And there were only four channels. <laughs> yeah. So everything has changed. They have so much information at their disposal. But in a way, how do they, how do they focus? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's, it's difficult. With all the stress involved in college for students, mm -hmm. is, it, is it important for them to feel like they're in a family environment in college? Oh, very much so. Elaborate on that. Yeah, well, I remember um, a university president who uh, passed away about five years ago once said in, in a speech, the loneliest person on the face of the earth is a college freshman. <laughs> true. And I never thought about that until he said it, and I thought it's true. It's your... Your first time away from home, I mean, sure, you can go to boarding school, but still things are taken care of, care of. you have structure. Mm -hmm. Here you've got to make decisions on your own. Right. And you have to negotiate relationships and information, uh, competing narratives mm -hmm. of the truth in a way you never had to before. Right. So now all of a sudden there you are on your own, away from home, free of structures, with many temptations, and it's very easy to drift. Mm -hmm. It's easy to go astray. And what's neat about what we do is I think since we know our students so well, mm -hmm. since we know each by name, we can tell if they're not on the path they should be and mm -hmm. intervene before it's too late. What we offer is in four years for the motivated student, with two summers, mm -hmm. you can get both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in four years. So you're 21 years old, and you go up to, for an interview, and there are 10 other 21-year-olds next to you. Mm -hmm. And you went to MCU, and the employer says, what have you done? And you, say, you can say, well, I had these internships, I had these experiences, I have these, these great references from these professors who know me really well, and I have both a bachelor's and a master's degree in four years. Wow. That's quick. You're hired. Right. The next student comes in. They're 21. They say, oh, I got a bachelor's degree. Our basketball team did really well in the tournament. And I pledge for Alpha, Alpha, Alpha. Mm. Who cares? Right. Right? It's that real world stuff again. It's the real world stuff. So it gives our students an edge that other institutions don't have. And it saves parents money mm. because it's four years rather than six years, but also there are opportunity costs. Mm -hmm. Because if you're in graduate school for two years after your four-year degree, there's two years of income mm. that you are foregoing. Whereas here, um, you actually, for the same price, you get the, the six-year education without losing the two years of employment. Right. That's very true. Um, well, such a deal. Yeah, such a deal, <laughs> yeah. When you worked in the private sector, I read mm -hmm. that you um, gained experience about getting students internationally mm -hmm. to come. Um, how does that work? How do you get students from other places to come? Well, what you have to do is you have to be able to understand the culture, work with the agents. Anything on international with international students requires working with agents, whether okay. you like it or you don't. Interesting. Uh, and the interesting thing, the difficult thing, the challenge is to be able, you have to really know higher education backwards and forwards mm -hmm. and to try to convince the students in that country to look past brand mm -hmm. and shallow ratings. And that is the most difficult thing to do. Because if you're paying a lot of money and you're sending your child halfway around the world, yeah, you want to know that they're going to do well, but they don't understand often that it's not about going to Harvard or mm -hmm. Stanford. No. Right? It's about, it's about doing well right. wherever you go. And that really, nowadays, you need a master's anyway. Right. So you go to Stanford undergraduate, you still need a master's. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the greatest challenge, and also it was the, the cultural um, explanations and also the way business is conducted in the Ukraine or in South America and Brazil or in China are very, very different. And so for an American, 
everything is straightforward. Right. Everything is quick. Um, there are no uh, sub-layers, but that's not always the case in other countries. So it was, it was challenging. Mm -hmm. You make time for tours when mm -hmm. people come through. You're very busy. Why is that important to you? Because it's important you walk the talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we say that we're offering a personal experience, if we say that every student is sacred, that no student is ignored or bypassed, then isn't it the least the president can do to meet with prospective students and their families who are taking their valuable time to look at your university? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's symbolic, but it's more than that. Um, it's, it's important that the parents see that that personal touch is, is, commit, is com a commitment from the very top. And I have to confess, it's also a blast. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, what kind of things do students ask you or parents ask you? Well, they ask me um, what you would expect. You know, they mm -hmm. ask me about uh, uh, getting jobs, about internships. Uh, I remember one mother asked me, when, when can my son get an internship? And uh, I said, freshman year. It's important today. Right. And mm -hmm. she asked, she had asked the same question of a highly ranked university um, not so far from the hill. And we have the, a few of those. We have a few. <laughs> and the response to her was, well, by junior year, we should be able to place your son wow. in an internship. And when I said, your freshman year, and I wasn't lying, it was the truth, she said, you're going here. Wow. So I turned to him and I said, you have a smart mother. <laughs> That was a good question. And he came. You are also a dad. Is it difficult to take the president cap off and put the dad cap back on when you're dealing with your own kids? Oh, it's awful. <laughs> it's totally difficult. When I drop my daughter off to school, I have talked to parents literally for 25 years about letting go, yep. how to facilitate without over-facilitating, everything's going to be all right, and then you have to do it. Yeah and your lip starts quivering, and your, you start worrying. And I remember when she had <clears throat> her first roommate disagreement, and I went counter to everything I had ever said. I felt like the biggest hypocrite. I said, I'm picking up the phone, I'm calling whoever's in charge of that damn place. <laughs> and my wife said, put it down. Right. Right? So because you're emotionally of course. connected. Yeah. It makes so, it different. It was hard. What are you most proud of over the last year? I think I'm most proud of the very solid financial base we're on. We're doing very, very well. And uh, then, but of course, there's so much we still have yet to build mm -hmm. that I think I don't really dwell too much on our successes. Uh, but I look at how far we still have to go. So that's, but I am, I'm proud of, of where I'm very solid ground. Now the next step is to get better known and to, to get our, what we do, which is so special and it is done with such care and such excellence. Um, what we need to do is get that message out there so that people will start saying, wow, this is the real deal. You have many things on the horizon, and one of them is possibly bringing a nursing project in mm -hmm. with partnering with Little Company of Mary. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, I, I love Little Company of Mary. Uh, they are a wonderful hospital, mm -hmm. and they're part of Providence Healthcare System, which is the largest healthcare provider west of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So I sit on their community board, and Mary Kingston, their CEO in South Bay, sits on our board. And so when we discussed early on about, since our missions were so compatible, about why don't we start a nursing program, which fits with our mission, uh -huh. it fits with our identity, it fits with, uh, with our real world focus, uh, and our missions are, are so aligned, uh -huh. the personal care that that little company gives to each patient is truly exceptional. And for them, healing is a calling.
-hmm. It's not just a service that you pay for. So for us, education is a calling, not just a service rendered. So it's same, it made sense for us to work together. They have the expertise. We are able to teach uh, science and math and English and everything else that is part of an outstanding education. They have the clinical placements right. and they have the expertise in nursing. And so it made sense when I went to them and I said, why don't we form a program? And while the students are in the nursing program, you teach them little company and provident systems. Huh? Real and world. Real world. So it saves them money and it exposes our students to not only to learning uh, nursing and the art of nursing and the vocation of nursing, the practice of it, uh -huh. but they understand how to apply it from day one in a real hospital setting with real patients. Okay, no real summer vacation for the president. What do you like to do when you're not here? Which isn't very much. Um, I worry when I'm not here, so <laughs> I'm always here. Um, well, I enjoy fishing. Uh -huh. I enjoy hunting. Uh, there's not a lot to do in California, but there's some. Yeah. And uh, I enjoy nature. Uh, so I'll take hikes in Del Cerro Park, which is half a mile from my house. And, um, and I like to work out, so I work out almost every morning. Okay, a year ago you shared with me that when you moved here, your son asked if there was a pro football team. Yes. Have you been to any Rams games yet? Uh, no, I'm dying to go. Okay. <laughs> I'm dying to go. Uh, you have this yeah. season coming up. Yeah, I, I need to go. So we watch the Rams. Uh, we, we lament. <laughs> Uh, the the building period. There's always pain before the before the glory, right? Um, but I need I need to go. Yeah, you need to get more LA sports going on. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm always looking for free tickets. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, lastly, as you look forward, um, what are your goals still? In five years, I want to be a nationally recognized university mm. that offers outstanding. Uh, educational opportunities to its students, maintains the personal touch, uh, but is known far and wide throughout the land. Looks like you're on your way. Little by little. Very good. Yeah. Dr. Lou Madrid, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. That's my pleasure. And I love living in RPV. Awesome, awesome community.